Hello. And thank you for joining me here um, to start thinking about or continue thinking about or expand discussions on neurodiversity and mental health, which I think is a really important topic. Um, I'm going to be talking a little bit about evidence-based practices for lifelong mental health and well-being today, and would love to continue this conversation with anybody that wants to get in touch with me after um, seeing this presentation. Who am I? Uh, my name is Casey Burgess. Uh, my, my website and email address are there, so feel free to get in touch with me at any time if you want to continue this conversation, which I think would be great. I am a registered psychotherapist um, with the College of Registered Psychotherapists of Ontario, and my practice specializes in the mental health of neurodiverse children, youth, and adults, so different, um, different areas of, of neurodivergence. I started off, full disclosure, started off as an ABA therapist, but my practice has, has shifted over the years, and I'm going to talk a little bit about that during this presentation. My practice, I am, uh, in my practice, I am a DIR floor time practitioner, so I use that with many of my clients, not all of them, but um, the underlying philosophies definitely carry through um, with everybody that I'm using. I also teach in university. I teach psychology courses at, um, at an undergrad university, and I also teach some graduate level courses in psychotherapy as well. And I am the mother to two young adults, um, a partner and a friend. So everything that I talk about kind of applies beyond just work, but into my family and friends as well. So I want to just define some key terms before I get too far into this. Um, just using the terms neurodivergent and neurodiverse, a lot of times people use these interchangeably, but I just wanted to highlight what the difference is between them. Neurodivergent um, is kind of an umbrella of a bunch of different ways of thinking differently, of, of processing information differently. So if someone is not neurodivergent, it means their brain processes information in a different kind of way. And it might include some of these um, diagnoses that you see in front of you. Um, so a person can be neurodivergent. Neurodiverse means a bunch of different neurodivergent people all together. So um, that could include neurotypical people. It could include people that have some of these diagnoses. It could include a variety of people that just process information in different ways. So a group can be neurodiverse, an individual cannot. Um, also highlighted on there is that somebody can be multiply neurodivergent. Um, so, so we might have a variety of diagnoses or a variety of different ways of processing information. But um, yeah, neurodivergent refers to an individual and neurodiverse to a group of people. So in just getting thinking, I, in just getting started, I want you thinking about whether neurodiversity has impacted you. When I ask these questions, everybody's hand goes up typically. Um, we've all witnessed neurodiversity in some form, whether we recognize that it was neurodiversity or not. Um, we've seen a lot of different kinds of supports in the school system, in the work system, in day-to-day -day life um, of people supporting others with a neurodiversity. So that might be behavior therapy. It might be teaching specific skills. It might be social skills groups. It might be specific learning interventions, those kinds of things. But an interesting question is, well, now that we've seen that help happen, the problem doesn't exist anymore. And it's an interesting question because as much help as we have out there and as much effort that's being put into supporting people with different processing abilities or different ways of processing information, as much as we're doing all the effort, I, I know there's a lot of people out there trying hard, teachers and clinicians and speech and language pathologists and OTs. And um, so there's a lot of help out there, but the problems are continuing. Um, if what we were doing was working, we wouldn't have these problems anymore. So I think that that's what we're here today to think about is, is there another way of thinking about this? In terms of neurodivergence, just a few stats here for you, about 15 to 20% of the world's population shows some kind of neurodivergence. Um, over 2% of adults in the United States have um, autism specifically. 
I tend to avoid using the term disorder and I like to use the term autism because it's a different way of processing, not a disordered way of processing in my mind. I think a lot of people would agree with that. Um, in terms of mental health, there was a large sample study, which when we look at a large sample study, it means we looked at a lot of different people. So it's not just a small study looking at a few people. It really has, has bigger impacts. Um, and that was done in 2020, and it showed that almost 78% of kids with autism, um, so those that are aged 3 to 17, have at least one mental health condition. Nearly half of them have two mental health conditions or even more. Um, that's in comparison with youth without autism, um, have only about 14.1%. Only about 14.1% of them have mental health conditions. Um, only sounding like it's small, it's still a big number. And we see mental health conditions present in 44.8% of preschool children with autism. So there's, there's huge numbers of mental health concerns within the field of autism specifically. So I want to tell you a quick little story, and it was it was an interesting experience. So just before I was going to be presenting um, uh, a presentation, I was at a beach, and there was a family playing there, and there was uh, a small kid about this age. This is a stock photo, but there was a kid about this age um, playing in the water and kind of falling over and running and 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 surfing in the waves and just having a great time and on the way out of the water just looked up at uh at mom and dad and this big beaming smile and just said ah oh, i'm having so much fun and it literally brought a tear to my eye um partly a tear of joy but also a tear of sadness because in my practice, that's kind of the opposite uh, of, of what's happening. I'm seeing a lot of stress about the world. I'm seeing a lot of worry about day-to-day -day activities like school. Um, I'm seeing a huge decrease in how much kids are just enjoying life. So seeing that pure joy of life was, was amazing to see. And that's my goal is to see more of that happening in the world. So one of the ways that I see working towards that is asking a big question. And a lot of what I wanna talk about here comes back to this question, why? Um, and it's applied in a few different ways. So when we're asking why, in this case, it's, well, why? Why are kids so sad? Why are kids so stressed? Why are kids having such a hard time with life in general? Why do we have kids that are refusing to go to school um, at alarming rates? Why do we have kids that are having a hard time going to school, um, even if they are there every day? Why do we have such a rise in mental health concerns? Um, so I want to start there. So in thinking about the why, what are some of the reasons for mental health problems? Um, why might um, some of our neurodiver neurodivergent folks um, experience higher levels of anxiety, um, higher levels of depression, higher levels of worries overall? Um, is it because they feel less than in some way? And if that's the case, why? Why would they feel less than? Is there any oppression there? Um, oppression being the state of being subject to unfair control or unfair fair treatment. Has there ever been, um, are, are there people in their lives that have been trying to control what they do or say or tell them this is the way to do that? Is it a result of ableist supports um, programs or just society in general looking at the world in terms of this is the way things are and everything, everything and everyone else beyond that is an exception? Is it because of being excluded from groups because they have differences in learning and social skills? So we're putting all kinds of money into intensive early intervention, um, millions, billions of dollars into early intervention. So why isn't it working to help well-being? Why, with all of that money and all of those skills being learned and everything that's being taught and worked on, why do we still see mental health problems? So in terms of my journey, um, I started off doing a behavioral approach. I was trained as an ABA therapist using a behavioral philosophy, um, and that kind of evolved. I found that that wasn't 
it didn't feel that comfortable. It felt really scripted. It felt really awkward. It felt really robotic. Um, I didn't love it. What I did love was seeing that we were able to teach so many high level skills and we, we had graphs of, of all the learning that was happening at a really quick pace, which was pretty cool to see, but it wasn't enough. Um, I wanted to get down on the floor and play and, and engage and, and, and do that kind of thing. And I wanted to do that as more as more than just the break time in between teaching skills. So I trained in CBT, cognitive behavior therapy, and um, really kind of learned, okay, well, there, there's more to it than just behavior. Yes, um, there is the thinking part and what's going on in our brains. But there's the question, do we feel better when we just control our thoughts? So when we were doing, when I was doing ABA, it was about controlling or managing behaviors, whether we're trying to increase something that we're trying to teach or decrease something we don't want to see. Um, CBT is really just looking at how do we control our thoughts? How do we change our thoughts in order to feel better? So it still was very much a self-control kind of thing. So it helped, it added a piece, but it wasn't enough. When I started doing my PhD, um, I started learning more about how to think critically about the research. Um, I learned how to reframe. So the research was very clear. ABA worked. Um, all kinds of research. There's no question there. Um, there's a lot of research that says, yep, ABA is effective. But what does it work for? What is it effective at? And I started thinking about other ways to think about child development. I started learning um, from Stuart Shanker. Uh, his framework for self-regulation that he calls self-reg. Um, it's really a much more inclusive and respectful way to promote well wellness from birth on, regardless of what the diagnosis is, because we all have self-regulation skills that underlie the things that we do and the way that we engage and interact with the environment. We all need to self-regulate. Um, it really is a shift in perspective away from some of those really behavior and cognitive control models and towards an understanding of self-regulation as the way that we manage our energy, the way that we manage our attention to really proactively prevent those stress behaviors from happening. So we don't need to manage the behaviors because when we're doing well, when we're feeling well, we do well. So really just wanted to highlight the idea that self-regulation is not the same thing as self-control. So I went from using that kind of self-control mindset to learning how to use more of a self-regulation mindset. And I'm still learning and still developing and still working on those skills. It's really kind of a shift. It's a difference in how we think. So if we're thinking in self-control terms, we're thinking about behaviors. When we're thinking about self-regulation, we're thinking about feelings. What does that feel like? What does it feel like in your body? What does it feel like in your mind, in your brain? So we're thinking about that before the behavior even happens. An interesting thing is we don't have rewards and consequences for feelings. Those feelings are the rewards in themselves. When we feel good, we do well. When we use a self-control mindset, we're talking about managing behavior. In self-regulation, when we take that mindset, we're looking at managing energy and tension, not the behavior. Because if we've got energy and tension well understood and we're responding to it effectively, we don't need to manage behavior. In self-control, sometimes there's some self-judgment when we don't do something perfectly. In self-regulation, we're learning to look at ourselves with soft eyes. We're learning to look at ourselves with understanding. And we realize, ah, when we've done something that we're not very proud of, we, looked at, we look at ourselves with soft eyes and realize, oh, wait a second, um, it doesn't have to be perfect. Um, and it's okay. So we're, so we're using a lot of soft eyes and understanding through reframing, which I'll talk a little bit about. In self-control, a lot of times we have those thoughts of there's something wrong with me. In self-regulation, we flip that a little bit and we say, no, 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 there's nothing wrong with the person. And whether that's myself or someone else, um, rather there's something wrong with the environment. And if we shift that environment, we adjust that environment so that people can do well, then we have fewer of those feelings of there's something wrong with me. In self-control, sometimes there's a power imbalance in relationships, right? With self-control, if somebody's trying to teach somebody self-control, there usually are rewards and there's usually consequences uh, that, other than rewards. Um, but somebody is the boss of saying, 
here's what you do and here's how you do it. Whereas in self-regulation, relationships are a lot more balanced and equitable, compassionate. There's a lot more respect, even for young children, um, where we are just presuming that they are competent um, to really do well. So what I want to talk a bit about is the research, um, to think critically about the research. Can we think of it differently about how we use ABA? Because we certainly can't argue um, against ABA. It's got a strong evidence base. It's definitely one of those that's up there as a gold standard treatment for um, children on the spectrum. But we ask, what is it effective for? So a lot of the research on ABA has mostly been done by neurotypical researchers. So there is that bias there. Um, much of the autistic community actually speaks out quite strongly about uh, against ABA. Um, studies have shown that 46% of, of kids exposed to ABA were later diagnosed with post-traumatic stress. So yes, it works, but what's happening? Um, ABA is definitely proven effective for teaching skills. We can certainly teach skills that way. We keep going to work because we keep getting a paycheck. And so we, I'm certainly not arguing for behaviorism as a model. I'm just saying, let's, let's think about what we're using it for. Um, as an intervention, when we're doing that, it's really based on deficits. It's looking at what are the milestone skills that neurotypical kids have that autistic kids don't have, and how can we teach those skills in a really intensive kind of way to help them catch up. Um, it's aiming to teach neurotypical behaviors. But think about what that does to children's mental health. What message is it sending about acceptance? Um, well, think about that. When somebody tries to control how you act and the way that you do something, how do you feel? So in terms of the impact on mental health, there has been some research out there that looks at some of these ideas. Um, Harris and colleagues in 2015 found that repetition can lead to inflexibility in the way that we think. Um, and think about what inflexibility can mean, right? Inflexibility means I can only do things one way. Inflexible, inflexibility means there's only one proper way to do something. And if I'm outside of what uh, my expectations were, then it's imperfect and it's wrong. So adverse consequences of that kind of inflexibility, um, skills get more complex. So as our social skills get more complex, for example, um, we don't want to have an inflexible kind of way of approaching the world. Um, if we reduce how much repetition we're doing in an intervention, sort of more naturalistic and less, less with rote learning, um, it can actually enhance learning, bigger learning over the long term, um, and really help with generalization in autism. Williams in 2008 did a study that found that uh, children with autism form strong connections in the brain that interfere with cognitive flexibility. So supporting the Harris study. So interventionists were, were cautioned to use, um, well, asked to use caution when using rote or really structured teaching methods. And again, interestingly, 46% of respondents on the spectrum who were exposed to ABA met criteria for um, post-traumatic stress. And there's a link there if anybody's interested in looking more deeply into that one. So when we ask people on the spectrum what their thoughts are, firsthand experiences, a lot of folks say that deficit-based approaches and attitudes are traumatic. Um, a lot of these are specific to ABA, but, it's, but overall deficit-based. Um, and folks say that they've been made to feel less than their neurotypical peers, like there's something wrong with them. Um, a bunch of these links here, um, you can Google them if you're just looking at the slides. Um, and uh, if you have a copy of the slides, you can click on the links, but lots of different resources out there that really talk about firsthand experiences with ABA and how and why they have been traumatic. But essentially a lot of them come down to the fact that um, People don't do well when they feel controlled all the time. People don't feel well when they are made to feel like they are less than, like they are, um, like they are doing something wrong, like they are wrong. Okay, so just some resources that you can dig into. So there was a collaboration. So coming back to that question of why, there was a collaboration between the CDC and ICDL. Um, 
that looked at emotional and developmental challenges. And I'll put a link to this at the end of the presentation as well. So you can read this, um, the whole report. But essentially what it found was that our approach shifts when we ask different questions. So instead of, does it work? Let's go deeper into different kinds of questions. What does it work for? Um, and they put together a series of questions to ask. So these are the kinds of questions that we want to kind of gear towards asking in terms of self-regulation and intention. Asking caregivers, does your baby look towards you when you're smiling or giving them other interesting looks? Um, how do you feel about the way you're able to help your baby calm down? Okay, so not a behavioral measure there. In terms of relationship, examples of questions might be, is your baby usually happy and smiling or making interesting sounds when he or she sees you? In terms of social interaction, does your toddler take delight in showing you a toy or a favorite picture in a book? Um, so we don't have a lot of those kinds of questions in ABA. We don't ask, oh, did they take delight in showing you a toy? Um, and then lastly, meaningful use of language and play. How do you feel about the way that your toddler or preschooler uses words or ideas? So this is giving a lot of respect to caregivers for being the experts on their children um, and for prompting ways that parents can think about their children's development as opposed to do they know their letters or do they know their numbers or you know, can they point to the right answer in a book? What if we ask some of these kinds of questions, which I think are really important ones. So when we ask those kinds of questions, we're kind of taking a, a paradigm shift. We're thinking in a different way about human development. So rather than thinking about human development as a series of milestone behaviors that, um, that that's what development is, instead of trying to change the child to meet that set of milestones that we've said are development, we start to trust in children's competence because they will learn if given the right environment. We want to create those environments that let them thrive. Um, there's a wonderful book by uh, Thomas Boyce, The Orchid and the Dandelion, um, which really looks at the fact that we've got some kids that are like orchids and some kids that are da like dandelions. So our kids that are like orchids need some extra environmental support. They really need to be in exactly the right environments to thrive. Whereas um, some of our kids are dandelions. You can plop them anywhere and they will grow and thrive. Um, so we think about the environments that they're in and the fact that some kids are gonna need very different environments. It's not just set up a classroom like this and then everybody will be all right. Um, we really need to change the environment and that includes the relationships within the environment. In terms of the evidence base, um, the link that you see on the slide there is the quickly growing evidence base for development and relationship-based approaches. And you'll see a link to my website at the end of this presentation as well. Um, and I've just posted uh, a lot of the research, a lot of the links, some directions that you can take in looking at that really strong evidence base for developmental approaches as well. So we're starting to see the research take that kind of direction as opposed to, to saying everything needs to be behaviorally based. Um, and hopefully we'll see government funding and we'll see school boards and all that kind of stuff um, paying attention to some of this because it's really been out there for since the 90s, which, you know, that's a good 30 years ago. Um, and we're seeing this come in, but we're not seeing it in practice as much as we should be given that the last 30 years of research is pointing in this direction. So developmental approaches make the assumption that children do well when they can. That's a, an idea from Ross Green. And if you haven't read any of his stuff or seen any of his presentations, please do. Um, when we're using a developmental approach, we are focusing on self-regulation first. We're looking at that nervous system, which is the first thing that starts developing when children are born and continues to develop throughout that first year of life. It means we recognize and we respond to stressors. We don't try and control behaviors or emotions that can be damaging, right? As we've already talked about, we work on connections before we work on corrections um, because that's what's going to help support that initial um, nervous system, the, the ability to engage and connect and interact with the environment. 
we work on flexibility. We follow a child's lead. We don't say this is the way that you have to learn this. So here's the lesson plan and here are the materials and here's exactly what you need to do with them. We're flexible. We want to follow a child's lead, see what they're going to be drawn to, see what they're interested in. And then we get things cooking. Some uh, wording from Dr. Stanley Greenspan. Um, yeah, it, it's follow their lead, connect with what they're doing, and then let's see where they're at. Let's see if we can push them a little bit not too hard that we're getting to the point of dysregulation, but let's nudge just a little bit. And as that's happening, interactions are getting more complex, communications getting more complex, and that brain is developing through relationships, through interactions, the way that we're meant to. Another important point at the bottom there is that we need to take care of ourselves because when we are self-regulated, when we're regulated ourselves, we have that authentic twinkle in our eye and kids can see that and kids can feel that. And so we need to make sure we're taking care of ourselves because only through doing so can we share our calm and our joy with the people around us. And that goes for adults, not just kids. So I've borrowed some, some slides, some visuals from NeuroWile. Um, this is from M, an autistic and ADHD speech and language pathologist, illustrator, advocate, and mother whose work is fantastic. Um, check out uh, NeuroWild on social media and, uh, and some of the online resources. Um, but a quote here, depleted men mental energy and dysregulation so often keep us from accessing our executive function skills, which in turn, so if you see that at the bottom, so that in turn stops us from doing the thing, right? So we've got this goal, but executive function skills might get in the way. Rewards and punishments, not going to help you climb this ladder. We need to have the ropes removed. We need to remove the barriers because as much as rewards and punishments um, might impact your desire to get to the top, if the barriers are in place, those are the barriers, not the lack of rewards. So we need those ropes removed. And we might need someone to support us going up those stairs. That's another thing, right? Somebody can help going up the stairs after we take those barriers away because they're steep and they're scary. So we're thinking differently about it. It's not about, well, we just need to reward in a different way or through a different schedule. It's about what are the barriers? How can we take them away? And how can we walk alongside somebody until they're able to walk on their own? So I wanted to share some success stories about what I do with that information. How do I think? What do I do? Um, and the way I think about it is I am the strategy and I have learned to think that I am the strategy. It's not about here's a book and here's some strategies and here's some lesson plans and what do I need to do? Um, it's how, how do I interact? with the clients in my practice. So these are just kind of generic. They're pulling bits and pieces from, um, from some of my clients, but they're, they're kind of generic overall ways of supporting clients. So let's say I have an adult with autism. I work on celebrating autism, helping that client to realize that autism is a really cool thing and there's lots of positives that come out of it and that autism is a different way of thinking, not the wrong way of thinking. I often use the analogy of um, using a Mac versus a PC. They do the same things that some of them are better at this thing than at that thing, but they all can get the job done and they can all do it just as well but they certainly have a different operating system. So autism is kind of like a different operating system. I help to focus on, on the ways that my client's autism helps them to succeed. So what are the ways that autism helps you? Does it help you to be more organized? Does it help you to be able to focus on something for a really long time, the way that neurotypical people just can't? Um, so looking at some of those kinds of things, but then also saying, well, you know what, if organization's a problem, let's figure out some ways to organize based on the way that your brain works. Maybe if your brain works visually, we're not going to do a trying to remember all of the things. We might use a visual to say, okay, here's a visual to lay out the day or the week or the work that we're going to do. But ultimately, I listen. I listen to the experiences. And rather than saying, ah, that's the problem. Here's how we can work towards being more neurotypical. It's, oh, wait a second. What's important to you? What is the impact to you? What do you want to see? What are your goals? Um, 
for caregivers as well. I see caregivers with a lot of different individual needs in their children. So I validate thoughts and concerns and instincts um, towards their children, their daughters, their sons. Um, I work on validating that because a lot of parents are given the message along the way that if it's not working, then they're doing it wrong. Do more of this, do more of that. Um, and a lot of parents come out of parenting supports given the the message that what they're doing is wrong and that's why the problem still exists rather than well let's look at some different ways of doing the things um psychoeducation has helped a lot of clients to help them understand a developmental approach to understand the self-regulation framework to understand the difference in a behavioral approach and a developmental approach and in doing so parents can see caregivers can see oh okay well we can do things in a very different way and it's not just a different strategy, it's thinking about kids in a different way. And it's not a huge amount of work um, to just say, well, let's start thinking about things this way. It is gradual. Um, it certainly will take time. It's not a one and done kind of program. Um, but when we start thinking differently, we start to see differences in our kids. Um, when I approach parents like that in partnership, because they are the experts on their kids, they feel felt. Um, one example where the client has given me permission to talk a little bit about um, their experience is that in learning about developmental approaches as opposed to behavioral approaches, they've learned that there are other ways to do things, that they are not a bad parent, that really they have been a fantastic parent along the way. They've been putting so much time and effort into learning how to support their child in the best way. And in getting a, moving away from behavioral approaches and towards developmental approaches, um, they're really feeling like a good parent. They know that they're a good parent. They see such differences um, in their daughter now with that new approach to parenting. They feel um, less guilty. They feel stronger and more confident themselves. And that is playing out in their relationship with their daughter as well. So that's just one example of that. Um, I work with a lot of adults with anxiety as well. Um, and a lot of times what I'm doing is just acknowledging the way that early experiences can lead to clients feeling badly about themselves. And that's okay. Um, doesn't mean that something's wrong with you. But when we realize, oh, that's where those feelings come from, um, it helps to take the edge off of some of those feelings. We work on creating experiences and environments where clients' uniqueness is appreciated. So I do a lot of supporting kids and teens and adults in self-advocating so that they realize it's okay for you to say, here's something that I need. I can succeed, but here's something that I'm going to need in order to do so. And when we do that, we're helping to feel, we're helping people to feel that compassion. We're helping to people to feel understood as opposed to feeling judged for not doing things the way that somebody else wants them to do. Um, so people feel heard in, in something like that. People hear that their stressors are valid. They are important rather than just brushing them off. Um, I've worked uh, with teens and adults on the idea of enough. So what is enough and what is perfect? Because a lot of times what happens is we kind of imagine there's kind of this imaginary line and we've got enough. And we've got perfect. And when we want things to be perfect and we imagine, okay, this is what my outcome is going to be. This is what my art project is going to be, for example. And it needs to be this. This is what perfect is. And if I can't make it perfect, then that's got not good enough. Which essentially we're putting those two ends of that spectrum together. Perfect is not the same as enough. It doesn't have to be perfect to be good enough. And what we do is we take a look at how do we define perfect? What does perfect mean? What is a perfect art project? And that doesn't necessarily mean a digitally designed one either, because is that really art? Um, so we define what perfect is, and we define what enough is. Is it enough to just do a drawing that's really not that great, but expressed what you were thinking in that moment? And a lot of times that's what it comes down to, just for one example. So if that's enough, and this is perfect, it's almost never gonna be perfect. It's almost never gonna be less than enough. So that art project is gonna fall somewhere in between and all of the in between is okay. It's just fine. Maybe it's gonna be a really good outcome. Maybe it's gonna be not great, but still enough. So working on that kind of um, 
visual can help. I've drawn it out as a line on paper. I've drawn it as a line on the wall. I've used a piece of string, um, you know, to make it visual, but it's essentially defining enough and defining perfect and realizing that there's a big space in between those. We also practice doing things imperfectly. Um, an interesting story. One time when I was making a visual of that line and I did it so it folded over just right so that the perfect and the enough lined up and I did it and it looked a bit messy. So I did another copy of it. And then I'm like, oh, well, there's still words sticking out on the edge. I'm going to make one more copy so I can put it on my wall. And then I stopped myself and I thought, what is the point of this visual? The point of the visual is to show people that it's okay to be enough and not perfect. So I left it. Um, that's an imperfect visual that I keep in my office, which is a good one. But yeah, we can practice doing things imperfectly. Let's do that. We'll do it quickly. We don't have a lot of time. We don't have enough time to do a perfect version of that. So let's do an imperfect version and uh, let's notice all the things that are good about it. So those kinds of things. Um, and we have to look and we look at individual differences. I will draw alongside, I will sing alongside, I will play alongside kids, and I'm going to play and draw and sing differently. Um, and we're both going to have our own unique individual strengths and challenges. It's kind of interesting. As a post-secondary educator, I also support mental health and neurodiversity in my university classrooms. Um, I, I work really hard on relationships with my students, even if I've got bigger classes. I'm lucky to work in a small university um, where I do have quite small classes, usually around 30 to 40 kids, sometimes lucky enough to have smaller kids. They're adults, um, students. Um, but I work really hard on learning their names and they, they always look so surprised when I remember their names because they're, they're so used to, you know, in a classroom. Um, people don't necessarily learn their names or they assume that it's a big group. So all I'm going to do is I'm going to teach and I'm not going to get to know them. So they really appreciate when I can use their names when I'm interacting with them. I use a lot of humor. I'm just really myself. I'm not trying to be, you know, this hoity-toity professor at the front of the classroom. I just want to help uh, my students to learn. Um, and I use a lot of empathy. I trust my students. Um, I trust my students from the get-go. I make individual connections with them. For example, I recently had a student who looked really upset at the end of writing a test. And um, so as soon as I went home, I took that one test and I marked that test and no, the student hadn't done well, but they had passed. And so I sent them an email before I had even marked the rest of the, the class. I sent them an email letting them know that I know you didn't you know, you feel like you didn't do that well, but I want you to know that you passed and passing is enough. Passing gets you a credit. Um, everything else beyond that is extra. And it's a, you know, your mark on one test in one class in your undergrad is not going to be looked at again. It's not something that's going to have a tremendous impact on the rest of your life. It's probably never going to be seen again. Um, and just got uh, a really heartwarming response um, from them about that, that, that I had reached out um, just so they could have a nicer weekend. So little things like that, um, which are not really little things. They're, I mean, they're little things to do, but they're huge impact. Um, I write a syllabus for each of my classes that says alternate assessments are available. I don't require anybody to, to have a diagnosis. They don't have to have any certificate or letter or anything like that. Um, I encourage all of my students to tell me what their needs are. I've had students before where um, a few years ago, I saw a student that was struggling um, with writing a statistics exam. Um, and just really had written almost nothing down. And uh, at the end, I had some time and invited the student to come to my office and we took their, their test and I went through and I asked questions um, to learn about what they had learned about, to learn about what they knew and what they understood. And when we had that conversation and I was able to just write out what I was learning about their learning, they knew enough to pass the test. Um, and I gave them some, some extra time um, not after giving them any answers, but just listening to them to say, you know what, it doesn't, you don't have to be able to sit at a desk and write your answers for me to know that you have gained information from this class, that you have learned skills that you have developed. I, um, and I actively encourage students to tell me, and I tell them, you know what, you, you can tell me about your needs. I'm going to try and meet your needs. It doesn't mean that I can do everything for everyone, but tell me about what your needs are so that I can best help you. 
I create clear expectations. Um, I'm pretty firm on due dates. It's not, you know, try and hand it in by then. It's that is the due date because I think that clear expectations are important. But I also, and I don't take uh, assignments after the due date. But if a student, and I let them know this ahead of time, that if they get in touch with me because they're having exceptional circumstances, um, extenuating circumstances, or there's something that they're really struggling with, we can be flexible ahead of that deadline. And we'll work together to figure out a way to make that work for that student. I check in with them. If I see somebody hasn't been to class in a few days, I'll, uh, I'll get in touch with them and maintain that connection so that they don't feel like just a number, but somebody who, um, who really is cared about. And I care about every one of them. And I try and support mental health and self-care in every single class, even if it's not a class about self-care and, um, and that kind of thing. Um, for example, I arrange my schedule so that assignments are due before reading week so that they've got reading week to be able to relax and do some self-care um, so that they don't have to work on a whole pile of assignments on the week that they're off. Um, I give participation marks for self-care in some of my classes. So I will have them come in and tell me, what did you do for self-care this week? And they will get bonus marks or participation marks for doing that self-care and reflecting on what it is that they're doing to take care of themselves. And I share my own examples of, of self-care and my own reflections with them to model the process. So I'm not just teaching them content. I'm trying to model, this is how we take care of ourselves. This is, these are some ways that we can take care of other people too. So I want to pull in another few slides from NeuroWild again. When we are practicing self-regulation, we are doing these kinds of things. So first, we're observing. So we might see a student that's not starting their work. And rather than going and tapping their desk and saying, you know what, you need to focus, it's time to get started now. That's a behavioral approach. Um, it might even be an, if you get started, here's a sticker, um, or those kinds of things. Or if you don't get this done on time, you won't be able to go out for recess. Don't get me started. Um, so we see that student not starting their work, for example. Um, what if we said something like, hey, I notice you haven't made a start on that work yet. And the next step is, oh, I hear you. And that might be something like, oh, I see you haven't started your work yet. What's holding you up? I wonder what's going on. So instead of saying, why haven't you done that? Like there's something wrong. It's, you know what? Something's getting in your, getting in your way. Let's figure out what that is. We're inviting them to share their perspective. And then we say, I've got you. Um, it can be really hard to know um, when a student is having trouble. And a lot of times in a classroom, for example, teachers don't have a chance to have a long conversation with every one of their students. Um, but we can keep these ideas in mind. And there's Dr. Uh, Dr. Green again, Ross Green, um, saying kids do well if they can. So children do not make a choice to do poorly. Would they do well when they can? Obviously, something is impacting their ability to meet that expectation in the moment. And we need to think about, well, are we going for compliance here or are we going for that child's well-being? And we should always be prioritizing well-being over compliance because, again, compliance is not an issue when kids are doing well. So sometimes we need to adjust that expectation in that moment so that the child can meet it because when they meet their expectations, they do better. So maybe we modify the test. Maybe we adjust the amount of work that needs to get done because if that child could do that work, they would. Maybe we adjust the difficulty or maybe we change the way that they're able to do that work. Maybe we ask them, is there a way that might work better for you? How could you show me that you can do this thing? So oh, they've got a lot of ideas themselves. Maybe we take something that they're interested in and build that into what they're doing or allow them to build that into what they're doing. Um, and maybe we look at the fact that our expectations should not be entirely academic, but regulation. In Ontario, in our kindergarten program, self-regulation is a quarter of the curriculum in kindergarten. Um, so maybe we need to look at those expectations and figure out what self-regulation means. Um, it's got a different definition on the Ontario report cards when you look beyond kindergarten. It's described in very much a self-control and goal-oriented kind of way. So I think we need to do some thinking about that. Um, 
in terms of what our expectations are. Self-regulation is our ability to uh, really notice our, our energy and our stressors and our tension and figure out, well, how can we adjust that throughout the day so that we continue to do well? That's what self-regulation is. So some reminders specifically about autism. Um, a lot of these are just some great quotes that I've put in there. So feel free to take a moment and you can pause and read through them if you need to. Um, but thinking about what we're thinking about, do we need eye contact? Um, what are we sharing with our students in terms of our own feelings and emotions? Are we sharing calm with them or are we sharing stress with them? Do we need to be able to do things verbally or do we need to be able to write something down to show um, our, our growth and our learning and our development. And ultimately, being neurodivergent, it's not an illness. It's not something that needs to be cured. It's not something that needs to be fixed. Um, it's just a different neurotype. Love that wording. So in terms of some take home messages, we can ask ourselves, is what I am doing to support this individual neurodiversity affirming. Um, is there any chance that we are trying to show children or even reward children on how to conform to neurotypical standards? Or are we affirming that neurodiversity is an equally valid um, or neurodivergence is an equally valid way of, of learning and processing and getting along in the world? Um, we ask ourselves, are we trying to control what that child is doing or are we trying to connect with that child because the more we connect the less we need to do any kind of control we ask ourselves how we're taking care of ourselves so that we can share our calm with other people we ask ourselves if something's not working how can i think about how i can change that environment including the relationships within that environment um, what do i need to do to change that environment to make it a more safe more calming kind of place and we ask ourselves about behaviors why is that behavior happening and why is that behavior happening right now not how can we change that behavior but why is it happening let's remove those barriers so I wanted to share with you some of these resources that support mental health um, for neurodiverse individuals. Um, self-reg, self-reg.ca is a great one. Uh, that's where I did a lot of training and a lot of learning and a lot of connecting with other self-reggers um, to, to really dig deep into this, this paradigm shift, really important. Um, and these are all really aligned with that. Mona Delahook is amazing um, at, at doing that reframe of behavior. Hey Sigmund um, is a, a wonderful website with lots of resources, videos, and some great books that help explain the nervous system to kids in a really fun and unique way. Um, Dan Siegel has some great resources for, for taking some really complex neuroscience and understanding it in terms of how our brains and bodies impact how well we're doing. Stephen Porges, if you want to dig deeper into the science, if you're a bit of a science nerd like me, gets into the physiology of self-regulation, which is fantastic. NeuroWild, I've mentioned along the way. Um, and brightandquirky.com is um, a lot of great resources. They're designed for children that have multiple challenges, including um, being neurodivergent and, and gifted. Um, so having sort of those, those multiple challenges, um, you know, how do we meet the needs of really bright kids that don't process information the same way um, that neurotypical kids do. So um, another great website for resources. I've also got, I wanted to share just some of the research because we're talking about evidence-based, right? So these are some of the, the resources that can help us understand mental health for neurodiverse individuals. Um, so I'll leave that up. You can take a screenshot. If you've got the slides, um, you can copy and paste or you can click on some of those links um, or just take a, a photo of some of those resources. Um, some of them are books. Some of them are um, research studies, a little bit of... Uh, everything in there. And then lastly, I do invite you to get in touch with me. Please feel free to email me or check out some of the resources on my website. All of the um, ones that were listed in those previous slides, you're going to find links and videos um, and some of the research that um, is the evidence base for some of the work that I do in developmental 
um, therapy for, for children and adults. So I'd love to continue this conversation. I think it's an important one to have. Um, and I think it's important that we are not making it a, a side versus side thing. This is not here to say, hey, don't do behaviorism because absolutely it works. And there are certainly places. Um, I still use some ABA based strategies for teaching skills, but my foundation and my go-to is, is developmental. I wanna make that connection. I wanna have a relationship with kids. Um, you know, I wanna do that piece because we, I'm just seeing so, so much more um, that comes out of that than the work that I did in teaching skills through ABA. Um, even though ABA, there's lots of, uh, you know, better ways of doing ABA that are more naturalistic. Um, I really prefer as a foundation to look at something that's developmental. Um, so that's kind of my position where I'm coming from. But I am loving having these conversations with everybody. I think that they're important that we we talk and we connect and we say, hey, let's try this. And if it works, let's do more of that. Um, so please, I invite you to connect with me. And I look forward to um, hearing from anyone that wants to, to continue that conversation. Thank you so much.